Welcome to the Disruptor Network Podcast. Welcome back to the Disruptors Network. Uh, we have an amazing guest today. I'm really excited to have Kara Golden, the CEO of Hint Water. Uh, it's the water you see in all your local stores. She also is an author of Undaunted, which is on Amazon's and the Wall Street Journal's bestsellers list. And originally, she's one of the first female high-level executives in Silicon Valley as she worked at AOL. Um, she was named 2017 Entrepreneur of the Year by EY, and I'm really excited just to hear her stories. So let's get to it. Welcome, Kara Golden. Ignition, lift off. So, so welcome, Kara. I just gave you a nice intro before you got on here, but welcome to the show, and we're pleased to have you on. Thank you. Excited to be here. So, you know, I just uh, listened to a podcast with you recently. I'm a big fan of this is uh, how this is built with Guy Raz, and you were just on there, and and I'm in New York, obviously. So I, you know. You were talking about how you had, do you have an office and a house in Tribeca or just an office? Both. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Both, both of them. And it's actually, uh, it's interesting. We, we took over two floors. Okay. Um, and so one of the floors and it was like a live work building. And one of the floors, um, is, is my home. Uh, and then the other one is, is where the office is. Uh, yeah. so, but I haven't been there that much. Um, unfortunately <laughs> yeah. I've been there a couple of times, but I can't wait to get back and spend some more time there. But prior to the pandemic, I was, um, I was really splitting my time between, um, the two places and not only because we do so much business on the East coast, but also just, a, I don't know, like a, people would always ask me what goes on. I mean, the, j- just a lot of, I don't think New York has ever changed in terms of media. It'll be very interesting how much media will be done through zoom yeah. as yeah. compared to actual interviews, you know, live, but I think there's still so much going on in New York and I miss it. Yeah, you know, it's, so Tribeca is one of my favorite places. I lived downtown for a little while um, in financial district, not in Tribeca, but I love, and you know, it's funny you bring that up because people have been talking recently about how much during the pandemic, oh, New York is in trouble. And I said, New York will always survive. It's just what it is. And if you go back to now and your family's going to see that, because I know you see your family's here right now, it's packed again, Kara. I mean, the streets, are, the streets are crowded again. It's like nothing happened, you know? And so it's just, uh, it's kind of the city that, that that will never die, I feel like. It'll always be what it is because it's kind of, and you're in San Francisco. Where San Francisco's a lot like it where it's kind of like center of the universe, you know what I mean? Like the people always will come. So um, I'm happy and I know you're, you're kind of, you're on the West Coast, but you're also, in, how long did you live in New York City? Uh, well, it's, it's an interesting question. I officially lived there for six years, but when I was, uh, building the channel that I was responsible for at America Online, I was there a lot. And so I, I practically, I should have had an apartment there because I was there all the time. And we had an office in New York as well. So I spent a lot of time there. So I feel like in many ways I was there, you know, still living there because in fact, still to this day, I mean, just as much time as I spend in New York, people will catch wind of the fact they're like, what, you know, what schools do your kids go to? That's what I would hear <laughs> over time. And I'm like, oh, you know, and they were like, wait, where are those schools? Wait, your kids don't live here. And I said, I live in San Francisco. I don't live here. I mean, that's how much time I'm like, I got to go home. Like, <laughs> like this, is, this is not good. So. You know, in reading and reading your book, um, and you don't ne- necessarily point this out, but I was, I was amazed at your story. Uh, in a lot of ways, but I grew up in New York. I'm from Brooklyn originally, and then I, I started working in Manhattan. But um, you came from the West Coast for your first job in, into Manhattan, and that's like a, a scary thing. And I feel like you, you, your first job, you jumped at it and you came here. Um, did you always feel like you had, like, I know you call yourself kind of an accidental entrepreneur, but did you always feel like you had that entrepreneur spirit? You just wanted to explore. Um, different places and different businesses or like, was it scary you coming here to begin with? Uh, Totally scary. (laughs) I mean, the, you know, for, for me, look, I had seen, I grew up in Scottsdale, Arizona. I was, I still joke about that. I was an original settler. My dad had, you know, this crazy idea that that's where Scottsdale was going to happen. He was early. Um, It was, this is, you know, 1970 and there was no one in Scottsdale. I mean, it's, we still laugh when I go back there because there's a few families that were there as long as I was and so, and my family was, but it was, um, you know, just from seeing so many movies, my dad was constantly traveling as well. And I would hear about New York. And then when I went to 
college, that's when I, I would meet a lot of people from New York and I was always curious and asking questions. And you know, I'd say like, what's the Empire State Building like? And what's the, what's the village like? I don't know. I just always would pick up on this stuff and I'd say one day I'm going to get to go there. And you know, our family, I was the last of five kids. Our family was super middle class and, you know, we didn't travel. Like we got in the car and went to San Diego from Arizona. And that was like the highlight. And, yeah, and I, I, I was thought, a car traveler too. I, I say yeah. that all the time. I was on a plane until I was like 18. So no, it was just, it was not what we did. And it was, uh, so anyway, when I, um, when I had an opportunity uh, to really think about what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to live in a large city and certainly New York was kind of my top choice, but I was, um, I, I, I knew I wanted to go into journalism or I thought I wanted to go into journalism. And I kept looking in these magazines and every one of them in the masthead would say, New York, New York. And I, that's where I need to go. I need to go figure it out. And uh, I mean, it's a it's a funny story that I that I share in in the book. When I was going to New York, I you know saved my summer money so I could you know go out there and have a little bit of money, hopefully finding a job and would get some kind of paycheck. But I stayed with a friend of mine, uh, actually a friend of my sister's that lived in the East Village. And you know, this is the you know 1989, and it's. Um, and it was on St. Mark's between B and C. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I remember taking a taxi from JFK and landing there and going, wow, like we're not in Kansas anymore. I mean, this is really- well, I the mean, Lower East Side was, it was not great then either. It was not in the Lower East Side of today, obviously. No, I mean, it, I, I was explaining this to a friend of my, of one of my sons that I said, you know, all those Green Day songs about, you know, heroin and and uh you know i mean it's really like that that was like the heart of it and and i remember going up with my suitcase she's on a fifth floor walk up and i go up to and up to her apartment and i mean it's tiny it's like you know 250 square feet or something she's like there's the sofa and i've got an extra blanket and pillow it was fine but um the first day i had already gotten the job at at time and so the first day I, I said, so how do you get around? And she said, oh, the subway. And she pointed to the subway. I had never been on a subway before. And I said, so how do you, I mean, you pay that, you know, I want to seem like I know what I'm doing a little bit, that I'm not some clueless, like younger <laughs> sister of, of my sister. And, uh, you know, she, I mean, she's very nice, but she wasn't super helpful to me because I want, I didn't know about the tokens at that time or yeah. any of this stuff. And so I walk outside, I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to walk down. And all of a sudden there's this like painting of a body out inside, out in front of her apartment. And there was these two very nice police officers. And of course my curiosity comes up and I said, uh, so like, what, what happened here? And they said, oh, just move along. I mean, so yeah. just <laughs> another expect. person died. And I'm like, another person died. And then I'm thinking, oh, I'm in New York. Things don't happen like this in Arizona. And so I just kept walking, got to the subway. And people have asked me, you know, why didn't you go home at that point? Didn't you? Because I, I just thought, well, that was really bad. But I mean, how much worse could it get? Yeah. versus that so I just kept going and I mean the the world it, it just was I think for somebody who's so curious for me it just my eyes every day were wide open and I just I loved it and I I still love it I mean it's a it's a great place it's a great I will also say that although I always take the subway when I go back there now and I actually know how to take the subway and I <laughs> I'm, uh, would much prefer to take the subway um, to get around New York because I the traffic and faster. everything else. Yeah, it's, um, much it's such a great walking city, though, too, where just yeah. going and figuring out neighborhoods and they all have different feels, which is I, just I, awesome. You really hit it on the head. I, you know, I tell people that all the time. I was like, Neighborhood is, the, the, everything is so different. You can go five blocks and you're in a totally different place in Manhattan. And just like from Tribeca to Soho to the West Village and, and so on and so on. It just, totally. that's what's so great about it. And I, I'm the same as you. I was, when I moved into Manhattan, um, eventually I was just so curious and I would go out and just walk for the day. Like I would go out and just walk as far as I could and walk back. And it was just like so cool seeing everything. Um, that's why I still love the city on like holiday weekends because it gets empty. 
and it's like you have it, so it's it's super cool and unfortunately during the pandemic it was kind of empty too but when you would go there it would be really cool because it was like a quiet city you could see all these amazing things but um you know part of your story that i i was also really really interested in was that you were really one of the first high-level female executives almost in Silicon Valley at AOL. Like, I, and you don't position it that way, but I knew from reading it in the time frame, the time frame, you know, what was that like kind of breaking in? And, and AOL was really at the forefront of almost everything that was going on at that time. Can you tell me about your time there and what that was like? Yeah, so I, uh, you know, I moved to Silicon Valley and I... I met a New Yorker uh, who wanted, who I think actually saw how much I enjoyed life and always would only be in a job that I really appreciated. Wow. And for me, I felt like I could appreciate, I could make money, but I also wanted to enjoy myself. And yeah. that has been my life. Like for me, it just, if I can't have both, then it doesn't, it just doesn't work. And, and so he, you know, he, wanted a little bit of that. He wanted to, he was graduating from law school, uh, from NYU. And he was like, didn't want to work on, you know, in a big firm, he was getting recruited to go to some of the wall street firms. And he's like, I just, I'm not really that interested in it. And I'm like, well, what, what would you be interested in? And he said, I really want to like, I want to do technology law. And I said, Oh, what is that again? My curiosity. And, and then I said, well, I think that all happens like in Silicon Valley, like where Steve Jobs is, that that guy, like that <laughs> that's where all this stuff is happening. I didn't know what I was saying, but suddenly, you know, we get engaged and I mean, he's knocking on doors out in Silicon Valley. And it was, those people were not recruiting at, you know, even the better law schools at that time. They, they it, it was so new. I mean, who owned the rights? They, you know, call it intellectual property, but who owned the rights to like, jcrew.com and and the gap when their online business it was not so clear i mean you talk about bitcoin today and some of the stuff going on around that it, it's it's really like you look back in history there are things that happened in the 90s that were truly historical and nobody really understood exactly right. what yeah. it all lives so anyway we move out he's got his he finds a job with a firm in san francisco and i'm trying to figure out, do I stay with CNN where I had been, or do I, I really felt like it was a satellite office, um, which had a different feel to it than actually working in the home office. And so I just kept thinking about this guy, Steve Jobs. And I thought, how could I get a job at Apple? First thing, Apple's headquarters were significantly further from San Francisco than I had ever thought. I thought that they're like somewhere really close. And it was like, I was almost a hundred miles away wow. from, from, yeah, I didn't want to do that every single yeah. day. I thought that'd be terrible. But as I'm doing my research on Apple, that's when I stumbled upon this little idea that was incubated inside of Apple at rarely talked about idea that was a Steve Jobs idea that was still, I think, one of his more brilliant ones that was doing um, basically because of baud modem speed. So we used to, for those of you listening that might remember, there was this dial up. And as it related to services like America Online, you would like get in huge fights with your brother or sister who, if they were on the phone while you were in chat rooms because you get disconnected, you know, and then and all of that world that was going on. So Steve had this incredible idea to put graphics on a disc and then just tell the consumer, stick the disc in and upgrade. And so everybody was upgrading. And I thought it's kind of brilliant because the consumer doesn't need to know why. They just need to know to do, do it, something, yeah. right? Tell the consumer, don't ask the consumer, just tell the consumer to upgrade it. And as long as it makes it easier, then they'll do it. And so I thought, wow, there's five guys that work for Steve that spun out and they weren't in a garage, but pretty darn close in, in this office. And I cold called. Uh, this guy. And I said, Hey, I was reading about your company. I kind of like dreamt that Steve Jobs was probably hanging out there, but he wasn't. <laughs> but I just thought, you know, it's, it's pretty, I, I read about it. I think it's really cool, really interesting. I worked, you know, for CNN. He said, 
you worked for CNN? And I said, yeah. I mean, remember, like Ted Turner was still running around the office in his suit and cowboy boots and everybody thinking he's crazy. Uh -huh. And, you know, he's got this vision for 24 hour news, but that wasn't everybody's vision. People were still kind of like, who really needs 24 hour news? And we yeah, got right. six and it's like, it's fine. Meanwhile, there are other countries that are figuring out that, you know, they're, they're at war by CNN. And that's really what put them on the map. So I happened to be, you know, in these, in CNN when that stuff was happening. And this guy that I'm talking to at this little startup to market is like, yeah, I work for Steve. He's super cool. You know, he can be a jerk sometimes, but he's super, you know, he's really innovative. Yeah. But talk to me about Ted. I want to hear about Ted. Like, how did you guys think about, and he was more impressed by the fact that I like worked at CNN, even though I was a million levels below. It didn't matter, he, right? <laughs> he loved the brand. Yeah. Right. And he loved the brand and, and just the idea of like working for a brand. Anyway, so I get this. So pretty soon after talking, he's like, you know, are you looking for a job? And I said, maybe, I don't know. I'm like trying to figure out what I want to do. And he was like, do you think you could go out and talk to all these catalogers? And, you know, about building and, and uh, coming on with us. And I'm like, maybe. And he was like, well, do you think you could contribute? No one had ever asked me in any job interview if I could contribute. Good question. And, and I thought, yeah, I can contribute. And, and he was like, well, that's great. You should, you should come. And he hands me this like document and the document with an offer on it. And I take it home to my new lawyer husband. And he was like, they're giving you equity in the company. Like, didn't you just meet with this guy? I mean, this is, this is crazy. And I was like, okay, well, I kind of know what equity is, but nobody had given me equity when I was working in New York. And he said, well, it isn't worth anything right now, but I don't know. I mean, if it gets sold, maybe it'll be worth something. Well, a year and a half later, America Online came and absorbed us. And um, they said, okay, we're, we're doing this channel strategy um, and there'll be the, in, it, like real estate essentially. So it's like sports and news and this thing called shopping. And they said, Kara, you're, you've been like dealing with these retailers, you do shopping. Nothing's gonna happen in shopping right now. So, I mean, it'll be fine, but you know, e-commerce ways away, but just do research. You're not even going to have any revenue goals. We're going to pay you a salary, but I mean, they really, I think gave me this role because they didn't think that any of it was going to happen. It's a, whole, it's a whole life at this point. Now you were at the beginning of what became everything. Totally. Yeah. And I mean, so many crazy stories, um, you know, that, that basically, I end up get being, I'm the youngest vice president at America Online. I'm one of the few females at this level because everybody basically thought this was a tiny little thing. Like give her, we want her to stay, give her this thing, whatever. And uh, little did anyone know that it was going to take off. They finally, like two years in, finally saw the revenue that was coming out of this channel and what I was doing. And and they're like, wait a minute, uh, this is actually happening right now. And this is like making something. And, and uh, so anyway, at this point, my husband actually went in-house at another internet company called Netscape. And he was their first intellectual property attorney. Huge too, I, right? One of the original big companies in Silicon Valley as well. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And so he's, he's doing that. And then I'm sitting on a plane going, you know, the United pilots all knew me and I'm on every Monday morning going to either New York or DC. And it was, I mean, it was just an incredibly crazy time, but it was, it's, it, it's interesting because when you talk about real estate overall, the way that I really thought about my business that I was running and was, I, I really, I, I studied mall development. And I figured out that that was really how retailers that I was talking to, that was the language that they understood. So, and then they would, for example, if you had an anchor like Nordstrom's or you had an anchor like, you know, at that time, another big retailer like Macy's or 
or, you know, Sears or whatever, those, you wanted to be with those companies, right? There, there were people or uh, brands that wanted to be with those companies. And so that's how I really, um, you know, looked at building it and frankly, tried to figure out everything from sales per square foot. And, but a, a lot of what I was used to doing was building a puzzle without actually understanding the picture. And, and we didn't, we had other people out there like Yahoo and CompuServe and other people that were trying to do what we were doing. And I think something that I did then that, you know, frankly, I've done with Hint is not be so obsessed with what everyone else is doing, but instead try and figure stuff out for yourself. Like, how do you differentiate? So people would say to me like, well, CompuServe comes in and they do it this way. And I'm like, yeah, but we'll be out of business if we do it that way. And we want to stay in business. Like yeah. you're talking to somebody who wants to grow with you, but we have to like, here, here are, you know, I'm not going to sell you anything on, and tell you a different situation than what it is, but this is, this is what we have to figure out. And people would either say yes or no, and we'd need to know our walk away and all that kind of stuff. But, um, but yeah, it was a, it was an absolutely crazy, crazy time. And uh, so many stories from, from that time. You know, you said something um, during, um, the, the, during your response just now that triggered uh, thought my mind. The theme really throughout your whole entire book is a couple of things that you just said. The first thing is, is that you from the, a, a teenager just always picked up the phone and called and asked the question like, What's the worst that can happen? I'll call and ask. Like, and, and, and I almost saw that throughout your career up until when you started Hint, where you called Whole Foods and said, or you went in and said, what, could it, what would it take me to get on the shelves? Like, like, you just always ask the question that people are afraid to ask. Where did you come up with that mentality? Like that, like, because you've gotten a lot just by asking. Like, and, and you, have a, 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 like, I, you have a welcoming personality, so I feel like that helps, obviously. But you always just kind of call and ask the question. And I feel like you've gotten very far by doing that. Yeah, I think that so often, I, I think about this a lot. I think so often we we try and pretend that we actually know a lot, right? But I think that the people that actually get the most answers and, and also get um, kind of the furthest are number one, the people that listen, right? But also the people that are a little bit vulnerable that show that, you know, they're not that special right? That they're, that they, you know, this is what they're trying to do. They're, they're, they, they throw their cards on the table and they say, this is, this is what I'm doing. And, and frankly, those are the longer term partnerships. When you actually go into something and, you know, you're not trying to share your fancy title or, I, I mean, then people find out later, you know, sort of what you've done along the way, then it, it's like, they're like, well, but you're, exactly. you're actually really cool. You know, like, I just yeah, can't yeah. believe it. Yeah. Right. And so I think I've just, I've just always, um, you know, realized that from a, from a young age, I mean, even being an athlete, I mean, I would, I would, um, I loved doing gymnastics. I loved running. I, I just always felt like I, I wanted to be the learner and people would be like, oh, she really is pretty good at, at this. She's great at bar. She's great at that. But I would, I would always go to the meets and I would find the best people and I'd sit there and watch them. And they would think that I didn't know how to do that, but I would actually try and, and, pick up on things, pick up on skills, pick up on differences. Yeah, that's and true. so people would just like, instead of trying to waste my time telling them how good I was, I just instead would watch and I would listen. And, and I think that that is, that those are the people in any industry and in any sport are the ones that you have to, you have to watch out for, yeah. frankly, right? Because they'll just, yeah. you know, you know, they're the squeaky, they're the squeaky wheel, the quiet one, whatever. But those are, that's really, it's important. No, you know, more importantly, I, I, I preach to my, to my, to my salespeople all the time that 
you have to really always continue to think like a beginner forever. You know, we miss a lot trying to be an expert at things, and you just really identified that and something is a success point for you, that you always think like a beginner. You're always trying to improve. You're never too good at what you do to, to improve, or you're never too much of an expert to go look at somebody else, what they're doing, and try to improve it. And even in the business you're in now, and obviously, you, you know, from what I know about your story, you started the company basically out of a personal need. Like you decided you wanted to not drink Diet Coke anymore, and you were going to start drinking water, and water had no taste, so you wanted flavor in it, so you started making flavors. But you went into one of the hardest businesses to possibly go into in the whole entire world. And I, did you realize that on the way in when you were creating Hint that it was so difficult? And you know, I always tell people as an entrepreneur, you, everything sounds like a good idea. And go talk to somebody who's actually doing it, and they're going to tell you that it's not a good idea. So yeah. uh, you know, going into it, did you have any idea what you were getting yourself into? You know, I think that that's another thing that I've always, um, I'm really good at sort of, I, I allow myself to be scared for like a minute. And if I get it, I get this feeling that it's too scary. It's too competitive. It's too this, it's too this. I instead automatically go down to the bottom and try and break it down and figure it out because I don't like fear. I'm human. I don't like being afraid of anything. And so one of the stories I share in the book is, is uh, my fear of heights. I'm yeah. terrified of heights. And so, so <laughs> and I'm constantly trying to, you know, put myself into positions where I will get better and get more resilient with, with this fear. But I think that when I think about things, I mean, if you, even today, if it, like the idea of starting a company, right. Or taking on big sugar or the big soda people, it's like, you say it a couple of times, let other people say it, but then you just go do, and you break it down and you start making progress. And I think that that's how I've always thought about this concept of fear. And it doesn't matter whether it's in your personal life or your business life. I just don't, I never, I, I look back on things that I thought was scary now in my life and moving to New York city, right? Things will happen along the way too, that are just crazy, but you have to figure out, is it going to stop you? Is it going to put a wall up? Do you allow these things to come into place or do you instead sit here and figure out what can I do now? And, and I think that that is like such a big um, mindset shift when people start to really, really embrace it. But I think it really starts with this idea of fear and not being afraid of things. And I don't ever want to I mean, that's just a general thing, whether it's in business or in life, I don't want to be afraid. And I, and I think that's yeah. something everyone is afraid of something. And I encourage everybody to really look at what those things are, because I think you just become a better human. Um, it humbles you to actually share your fears with people too. And because I think it opens it up the conversation up to say, oh yeah, I was really afraid of that too. The most annoying people in the world are who are like, I have no fears. I'm so I'm perfect, you know, and I don't, I do everything great. I don't, you know, and, but instead the people that you actually want to engage with that you, you know, want to have beers with, or, you know, what hang out on vacation with, or the people that, you know, share their stories yeah. about, that about how, you know, they were scared of something and then they kind of overcame it, but they still have work to do on it. Those are real people that are vulnerable, that are authentic. Right. And, and what you realize is that when you, when you actually tackle your fears, um, tackle the, the soda industry, you learn a lot right? You, they just, they don't even seem that scary anymore. I mean, I'm friends with many people who are in the beverage industry now who seem totally intimidating to me when I first started. And yet here I was like, you know, an executive at, in tech that was considered, you know, a, a very notable, you know, executive, but suddenly when you don't actually have what somebody else views as, as, you know, credible as, as scary to them in some way. I mean, that's when you have the option to come in and really um, learn a lot and do things differently. And I mean, that's really been the story of Hint. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's really powerful. So you're right. I think that the people 
who are the are the flawed people who you want to talk to, the humble flawed people who can tell you like what mistakes they made and what, how they got past it, and they're still working on themselves. So that's really, really good advice. You know, I feel like you have a, a big competitor spirit in you too, because one of the stories you tell that's kind of a centerpiece of your book is you were able to, at the beginning of Hint, when you were having trouble, you were able to get a hold of somebody at Coca-Cola who was a big executive there. I think it was Coca-Cola. And mm -hmm. did, did he call you Sweetie or Honey or <laughs> something ah, like that? He, he, he called me Sweetie. Yeah. And <laughs> um, yeah, so I'll, I'll share that story um, quickly. So we, um, it was about a year into building Hint. And it was at a time when I was just doing a ton of heavy lifting. And I also had four kids under the age of six. And I mean, it was crazy town at my house. I mean, it was really pretty nuts. And uh, I just, I, there were things that I just couldn't figure out. I couldn't figure out how to produce our product without, um, without preservatives in it. Um, where our product hint, I have it right here, is an unsweetened flavored water. And so we use fruit and water and we don't use preservatives. My spec for the product was water and fruit and no sweeteners and no preservatives in it. I, had, I didn't understand why you couldn't do that. And so I kept asking people who were bottling my product, why? Because again, I didn't, I hadn't been in this industry. So I was able to walk into an industry and ask why. Um, and, uh, but after a while I was just hitting a wall cause nobody, everybody kept saying, you just can't. And every once in a while I'd run into people who said, well, I don't really know the answer, but I don't know the answer. So there. And so that's where I was at. And I couldn't actually figure out also how to distribute the product and get a hold of Cisco or anybody else who was going to like get my product on a truck. So a friend said, told me that she had sat next to an, a guy on the airplane who was a big executive at Coca-Cola and maybe he would talk to me. She exchanged cards with them. And so I said, that'd be terrific. And he ended up getting on the phone with me. Um, and I remember being so prepared for this conversation to be you know, the smartest in the world. Like I really know my industry and whatever. 15 minutes into the conversation, I'm telling him, yeah, they're buying it at Whole Foods. They're reordering. It's all like going great. He interrupts me and says, uh, sweetie, Americans love sweet. This product isn't going anywhere. And I was like, whoa, like I was never called sweetie in the tech industry or, you know, when I was at, at Time or CNN and here I am getting called sweetie. And, and I, I remember then he just went on to tell me why he thought the way that he thought. And I mean, you have to understand this guy's like, you know, very senior at a, you know, multi-billion dollar company. He'd been there for years. He knew his stuff. And so therefore I, I felt like I had to listen to why he felt like I was wrong and he was right. And he went on to tell me that what the consumer wanted was zero calories. We were, diet drinks were at like 10 calories at that time and that they just needed to keep sweetening it and getting it down to zero. And I thought, well, what if like people like me actually want health and they figure out that they're drinking something that is causing them to hold on to weight, you know, screwing up their, you know, blood sugar levels so that their energy is decreased, all of these problems, then do they still care about the calories? I mean, I wasn't saying any of this because I, also thought this guy has billions of dollars. Why do I want to turn his giant cruise ship around, to, yeah. you know, and help him think about these things. Right. So I hung up the phone. I'm quite sure that he thought I was giving up at that point. And I thought I have a choice. I either give up or I just put the gas on because he'll eventually get it. But I'm, I'm a little ahead here. And I think that there were multiple pieces of learnings from that story. But I think that the key thing that I realized is that people will say stuff along the way and you have to figure out whether or not it's going to affect you. Right. And whether or not that's going to, that's going to, you know, ruin your day, ruin your career. Um, or do you have, do you instead focus on your plan? And I, you know, I've, People have said to me, just being a 
woman, like, and running a company, I mean, this was my first startup. I had never raised money before. People said, was it harder to raise money as a woman? And I'm like, I have no idea. I hate raising money for like, I tell every single person I've ever raised money from, by the way, I hate this. I'm very authentic about it. I, I love you. I don't like negotiating. I don't like having this conversation at all. And people like that honesty because, you know, I just say it up front that what it is, but what I realized and what I say often in, in that context is I've never been a man. So I have no idea if it's easier to raise money as a woman. Right. It might be, but it's not helping me reach my goal at all. In fact, it's annoying and it's not like helping me. I'm not saying that it is or isn't. It probably is harder. But if you focus on the things, on the roadblocks, that doesn't help you. Yeah, you, took, you, you completely took away the excuse of it and you just did it. And, and it, it is what it is. You have to do it till you do it. But I, I agree that that's uncomfortable. And, you know, a couple of things you even said with that is, you know, so that happens, right? And um, you're like, you get off the phone and you're like, I'm going to stick to my plan because I, I know my plan works. Even though you're speaking to this person who's been in the business all this time. And then kind of throughout the growth of your company, that happened more times than not. Like, I was amazed that you and your husband stuck behind the idea of we're not going to give in to any kind of sweeteners into this drink because you went through a lot of problems, you know, getting the flavor without the sweetener to the clouds in the bottle to, to continuing yeah. to go. And then when you finally got that fixed, here comes vitamin water. Here comes this one. Here comes that one. Here come all the competitors trying to do what you've been doing already. And you still never compromised your brand. So I, 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 I won't... I don't want to say I was most impressed by that, but I was, I was very, very impressed that you never, ever compromised what your vision was for the company. And we're going to stick to this, and this is kind of what it is. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that mindset and just kind of knowing that I'm on the right path and I'm going to stick to it and I'm not going to let somebody kind of sway me off of that? Yeah, I mean, I think what I learned from, from working for, you know, incredible visionary people, some directly, some, you know, multiple steps down was that you have to be the one who is putting stakes in the ground around what you do. And you can change what you do, but you have to tell people that you're changing. You don't just go and do a change, right? I mean, how many times have you seen somebody say, wait, did I miss something? I mean, I thought that we were doing it this way. Oh, yeah, yeah, we decided to do it that way. Then all of a sudden you lose trust, right? And I've learned that about brands along the way. And it's the same with people, right? You just have to make sure that everybody knows what you're doing. But leading a company, you have to put stakes in the ground. And when you're saying something as important to people as no sweeteners, right? That, and, and you're messing with people's health. When you're, you're thinking, okay, maybe I'll just go and add a little bit of stevia because it's natural in the product. It's just not what we do. I mean, still to this day, we get people on customer service lines saying, oh, you guys should go do like this and just make it a little sweeter for, for other people. And I'm like, it's just not our product. I mean, there's a lot of other products out there that do that, but it's not what we do. And I think it's just, it's it really is what is your relationship with the consumer, but what is your promise? And you may not think it's a really big deal, but there's other people when they're using it as a descriptor for your product. And even when there's people in the story I talk about in the book, our investors, our investors were telling us um, really important investors, maybe we should just add, you know, some, some of that natural sweetener to it. I'm like, do you know what you invested in? I mean, do you, it's seriously, like, I'm not, I mean, I would say the exact same thing to a friend, right? It's just, this is what we do. And you shouldn't, you shouldn't be an investor if that's what you think that you did and, and or what you were investing in that we were going to change in some way anyway. So I think like that is a story of, I mean, if you're not going to put stakes in the ground around it, who is, right? And, and I think that that is, that is really important. Will you, will you be disrupted by putting stakes in the ground along the way because you'll watch, you know, vitamin water come out with their zero calorie product or whatever. What it does though, as long as you can stay alive, right? As long as you, this is what you do, 
every single day and people know, know you and you continue to move forward. You're the, you know, you're the tortoise, right? You can, you continue to move forward. You continue to stay alive. They'll be back. They'll be back to come and find you. And, and I think that that is really, really important to think about in every single industry. The challenge is, is if you get yourself into a position where you're putting stakes in the ground and you don't have enough capital to be able to weather storms, because there will be storms and disruptions along the way. And I think in, in your industry, I mean, as well, I mean, you're going to, you're going to see stuff that you can't control, but I think that just being really good at what you do, I mean, I'm sure this is not, uh, you know, your business, but like, let's just say that you do condos, but you're hearing that there's, you know, homes available in in New Jersey that you should be doing. You're in New York city doing condos. You should be doing that. Like what, what is the consumer? How do you describe it to the consumer? How do you storytell around why you decided to do that? It's possible to do it, but you have to go back to the original story, put stakes in the ground. We still do this, or we stopped doing this and here's why. Because when you bring the consumer along with you, that is is the most important thing. And and again, I learned it from the best and the, the leaders, you know, Ted Turner had other channels that he did, but Ted Turner, All he wanted to do was 24 hour news throughout Mm -hmm. the globe and that's it. And he sounded like a crazy man for years talking about it because people are like, oh, you should do, you know, other stuff. And then he spun off all other brands to do other stuff. He was right. Yeah. And, you know, I guess when you're right and you really believe it and you you have to stick with your vision, but you're right. I think that, and I've heard you say something um, a couple of times now, and you, you may have said in the book, but I heard in another interview you did where, um, when you when you first went out and bought like an Apple laptop, right? It had that that Apple on the front, and you thought to you, and yourself, um, Steve Jobs really knows what the person on the other side of the desk wants, right? Like he, he knows what his consumer wants. Um, I think you really with your with your product know what your consumer wants, right? But is that a feel, or is that research, or is that a combination of all of it? Like, how do you have the confidence in saying? I know what you're going to, I know what you're going to buy. And I know, I know what you really want. And, and that's my power. I think that the best branders, salespeople, again, it goes back to watching it. What it goes back to watching and, and, you know, taking the journey with your consumer. So, you know, in the case of, of the Apple, I mean, I remember when I was, you know, the stone age when I was in college, I saved up my pennies and I bought a Macintosh computer. There were computers that were out there. They were a little bit larger. They were the Apple was the first one that actually was pretty that you'd want in your room. I mean, it was just, it was just, it was aesthetically interesting. And it was, it, it, I wrote a lot of papers. I hated like this, you know, putting white out and screwing up the keys in a typewriter. I mean, it was just, I understood why I would want to have a computer, but I wouldn't do it because there was this aesthetic piece missing. And that's what I appreciated about Steve. And, and I think that when I look at people who are looking across the table, they solve problems. They don't, I've never been a believer. Anyone who's worked with me knows this about me that I, I don't believe in focus groups. I spent a lot of money doing focus groups when I was at AOL and because that's what they wanted us to do. And I thought it was a huge waste of money because you can always skew a focus group and get them to sort of tell you something, but instead, you know, fly the airplane, as I say in the book, while you're building it, just go out and figure out who how do you, how do you understand how the consumer is reacting to something in the cheapest way possible? Because when the consumer tries to figure out, uh, or shows you, you know, what they're potentially going to buy in the case of, you know, hint and beverages, 
you're going to learn a lot. You're going to learn whether or not, you know, the label was right, whether all of these things along the way. So I'm, I think it's really, it's a little bit of gut, but it's also just putting yourself in, in the shoes of, of the consumer. And I think leading like that, I mean, I'll give you another example, um, you know, along those lines at the beginning of the pandemic, my book was already, you know, in, in to the publisher. And um, obviously the pandemic had hit us in March. I was in New York, uh, closing down the office in the Hint office. Um, didn't know I was going to do that that week. I was flew out uh, March 11th and the team was really scared. It was the first couple of uh, cases at the gap right across the street from our old office. And they were really nervous and they didn't want to come into the office. And uh, I, it was a very different situation in San Francisco. Uh, the feel of New York was incredibly different. And I, I remember calling back to my head of HR and operations. I'm like, have everyone work from home right now. It's like New York is really, you feel it here and people are commuting in. It's just not good. And, um, and when I went back on the 13th back to San Francisco, I started to see store shelves empty. Um, we were getting a lot of customer service complaints that people were hoarding at stores and we want, needed to put a stop to it. I mean, it was crazy that whole weekend. I was just absorbed with what is going on right now. This is before the mandate to close offices and, and New, New York was just starting and then San Francisco followed. So we closed both of our offices and we are an essential product. So our, we always knew we were essential, but when you're FDA regulated and you're an essential product during a pandemic, there is different meaning to it. And so we had to use best practices in our company to make sure that shelves were stocked for Americans, we only sell in the US and that our plants were running 24 hours a day in order to keep up with demand. And so while all of my team was hearing that um, shelter in place orders were in effect, um, I was saying to my team, that's right, if you have an office job, but for a hundred of my employees, you actually, are not sheltering in place. And luckily we have N95 masks from all the fires in Northern California and hand sanitizers and gloves. And here you go. And so we had a couple of our employees reach out to me, obviously very comfortable with me. And they said, are, are you trying to kill me? <laughs> I mean, they were serious, right? Yeah. They were like watching in New York, watching everything going on. It was, you know, crazy. And I, I said, no, I'm not. And they said, have you, you know, seen what's going on? I mean, it's really bad. And I said, I, I have, I have seen what's going on. And so, you know, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to reduce the number of stores that you're going to go out to. So it's much more local. Obviously, if you're living with somebody, an elderly person or somebody who's sick, or if you've been sick, whatever, we're going to, we're going to definitely make some exceptions here, but we've also got employees that, you know, pieces of business that they were working on, like at Google offices and Facebook offices, those are shut down for who knows how long. And so we're going to move these people over very, very quickly going into triage essentially for, for our overall business. And again, we had to do this or we would lose our license. And so, it was at that moment when I thought, I can't lead from inside my house. I need to get out there and I need to see exactly what's going on because I want my employees to be safe. I mean, I'm sitting here saying, oh yeah, you know, here's your N95 mask and everything else. But I, am I really, like I've never managed through a pandemic. Am I crazy that I'm telling them to, to do this? And so it was at that point when, you know, I put on my Lululemons and my hint, you know, sweatshirt and my mask and everything else. And I went into Target and one of our huge, we have 18 feet of space inside of Targets. And 
you know, I started pulling cases out of the back room and, and then I found the manager and I said, Hey, you guys open at 7.00 AM. Would you mind if I come here at like 6.00 AM? Cause I just feel a lot more comfortable. Just, there's just not people, you know, in the stores, haven't been in the stores all night. Um, and, uh, is that okay? And he said, sure. I don't, I don't care. That's fine. There's somebody here as early as six. So that'd be great. And I said, terrific. And so I went home and I told all the salespeople, like I said, I just got the guys in the, in Marin County where I'm taking on a route and I'm going to go in and try and figure out strategy so that you're all going to be safe. And so they did. And it was amazing. The number of people in the beverage industry who basically froze and stayed complacent, we gained space through, through this time. And we became known as people who were, we were safe, but we were working and we were hustling. Right. And I think like that. So, so people have asked me like, how did you know how to lead during that time? And I didn't, but I'm used to building the puzzle (laughs) that I don't really know where it's going. And I just get out there and try, but I'm also willing to do every single job in this company. And I know every single job in this company. I don't do it every day, but I'm willing to go there in order to lead a team. And so that, you know, that, that's two things. Um, the fact that you became a frontline general again, I think is, is really, really powerful and, and, and I commend you for it more than anything. And I think what you said that it was the biggest key point. Um, and I went through 2007, 2008 in my business, which was a crash. And, you know, and, and when that happened the first time, I didn't know what to do. So I froze. Right. Like just like you said. So last year when the pandemic started and we kind of didn't know what was going to happen, I sat my whole team down. And I said, what we're just not going to do is freeze. No matter what happens, we're going to figure out how to move forward every single day. And at the end, this will come out okay. And real estate kind of went like this, so it was a different market. But, you know, I think the most powerful thing you said is that um, we weren't going to freeze, right? We were going to figure it out. And I think that's the best advice you could give somebody, that when the situations get hard, just figure it, get up and figure out the puzzle, right? You know, just put it together and figure out the puzzle. But they need need not only you as a leader to, to, they need to hear that. But the other thing that you said that's really important is that that's what makes you understand and that's what makes you resilient because you're not going to make the same mistake twice yeah yeah you're right yeah once you were through it once you you don't once you've been through it and those stories need to be told because people who have we have a a lot of people in our company where they they weren't working in 2000 they weren't they weren't old enough to be working in 2007 2008 and they were nervous right and and you they need you to lead and also show that, you know, you're vulnerable too, that you've never done this before. When people said to me, do you have any idea what you're doing? Not no, really. No, I don't, but yeah. yeah. I mean, right, not really, but I've done something similar before that I'm gonna, I'm gonna go try and I'm gonna be really aware. And frankly, I think that the biggest challenge is that I was, sharing with friends along the way that, you know, I was working through this entire thing um, was that it's, it's tiring because sometimes you're using skills that you haven't used in a while, not just, you know, getting in a truck and hauling cases and doing that stuff, but also kind of really thinking like, how is this going to work? Like what, how do I do this? And my purpose, my mission was for the health of my employees. That's all I was thinking about. I was, and I was thinking obviously that I wanted my business to continue, but if I didn't think that there was any way to move forward without making sure that my employees were safe, then I would have said, we're done, right? There's no way, there's no way to do that. But so often, you know, leadership just freezes or they're not willing to go in the pit themselves yeah and, 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 I, and i guarantee people followed you because you were willing to do it yourself like you were out yeah. there you, didn't, you weren't sitting in, a, in an ivory tower you're like i'm gonna go do this i think it's we can be safe and still do this and and i i think that you probably took the essential worker and essential needs thing very seriously like people need our product like they're going to need, need it more than ever right now we have a, we have a responsibility almost 
totally. And it's so, yeah, it's so important, but I really think, you know, when I look back on, on that time, I didn't do it so that my team would be proud of me either. Like, I think I did it because I, I wanted to make sure that they were safe. And I, I think it's funny because we had a, we have a few people who had worked at larger companies that thought, oh yeah, she's going out there and I'm sure she's like going and taking on a route in Marin County where she lives, I, you know, and a couple of people have worked here for 10 years. They're like, no, she probably is knowing her. She's, you know, stirring up stuff along the way. And, <laughs> you know, and it's, it's just, I mean, it's just good to be out there too. And I, I love doing that. I still love going out and selling and, you know, meeting with customers and, you know, talking to people and uh, along the way, but I also just love, I, you know, I, knowing what your team, ev- what your team goes through and, and their pain points and mm-hmm. what they fear, I think is, is so important for every single leader. It's just a, it's just, I, I think if you don't know that, um, you know, that everything, I mean, I, along the way, look, we, have audited financials from EY for the last five years. If I talk to my finance team, you know, they're, they're constantly that, that that's what makes them nervous. They, they fear it, right. They don't want to look stupid along the way. So understanding all these like elements along the way in every single aspect, that's how you, you know, stay the CEO of a company 16 years later as a founder, right. I, it, right. You just, you, you really understand every aspect of your business. You don't do it every single day, but I think that those are the things that I've learned along the way. Yeah, the name of your book is Undaunted, and, and I want to plug that a little bit because I, I think it's great, and I think it's a, a great read. And, you, you know, you tell a lot of stories in about it, about, you know, even you know, the story that kind of populates the last chapter where you went and tackled the fear and you went to the Grand Canyon and you hiked this crazy hike and at a time frame you probably shouldn't have done it, right? <laughs> like, but you did it, you accomplished, you accomplished it. You know, with that spirit, what do you think is next for your company or you, or what are you working on that you're excited about? Like, where, where do you think we're going to see you next? It's a good, it's a good question. I mean, you know, we had a crazy year. I mean, not just uh, because of the pandemic, but just really, um, I'm a huge believer that if anything good came out of this pandemic, it's that the more and more people are really interested in, in staying healthy and it, you know, health and wellness is just the top of everyone's mind with my book. I've spoken all over the world. It's not just in the U S I mean, every, no one wants this virus. They want to, they want it to just go away. They, they want to stay healthy. They want to keep their bodies as healthy as, as they can. And I think it's, it's the, there is no better way as a first step to start that than to start by drinking water or a product like Hint. I mean, it's just, it is just common sense that we do that. And so I feel like it, we are just hitting our stride. I mean, 16 years later for any entrepreneur out there too, you know, you know the, it always, the, it always takes, takes longer. Yeah, it's a long game. Right? Yeah. The best yeah. brands. I remember meeting with the guys when we were first starting from vitamin water and I thought they were like a few years old. I mean, they had, they were, I think 12 years old when we started <laughs> and uh, you know, they had, I don't know, one or two bankruptcies, depending on who you ask under their belt as well. I mean, it's just, you know, the, the challenges, it just, the re it takes a long time to build the right thing and different maneuvers along the way too. So, um, I don't know. I mean, I, we're, we'll continue to grow and service the customer and, you know, we're a direct to consumer business as well. Few people know that. I mean, we, like I said, we grew, kind of grew up at, Google offices and Facebook offices, and then, you know, continue to grow and Costco um, that happened during the pandemic. We went nationwide with Costco. Um, I mean, there's so many stories around even sort of being a little bit inquisitive about even how our, like we've built our supply chain and, and understanding things like we never, you know, believed that shipping 
product from China was the right thing because it just seemed complicated. We just didn't, we couldn't go there as often. I mean, we could, but we didn't, you know, want to just do that. Like there's language barriers, there's all kinds of, you know, things along the way that we thought were shipping bottles and what, like just caps overseas or whatever. It's just, maybe it's cheaper, but it's kind of a hassle. Like all of those things saved us and built our company even more because we do everything in the U S and so, I mean, it, it was huge, but I guess being a little bit paranoid and thinking for yourself and not doing what everybody else is doing, it, it pays off, but sometimes it, you know, when you're in it, you don't necessarily see that it's, you're like, ah, oh, I don't know, maybe, you know, we should save here and do this or whatever, but trusting your gut a little bit on how you're building it and building it your way, I think is, is such an important lesson, but I, I think just continuing to build, I don't know, looking at a lot of different, you know, possibilities, um, you know, one day, maybe you might see hint going on the public market. Um, we'll see. Uh, so that, that, that would, uh, you know, I thought about that, obviously. And, you know, you, you, you said a couple of things along the way that made me think that. But, you know, I, your product's something we have in the office now. And, and thank you for a box you sent over. But it's in, it's in our office fridge. And, awesome. I, and I really enjoy it. You know, I, I drink water all the time. And sometimes you need a little flavor. So I like the product. I love the book. Um, you know, I have to say that. I've not only read the book, um, but I've gifted it to at least three people at this point now because I like to do that to give people like, hey, like, this is something you should really read. Um, and I, some, it's something I've gave to other people. Like, this is a powerful story. And more than anything, I think what you gave me is that sometimes just ask the question or just ask for it or just do it. And, and, and you know, I really truly believe in that myself. But it was great for you to reinforce that in my brain because it's really worked for you. So. Um, I love it. I was amazed by it. I suggest everybody picks up the book. I suggest everybody picks up the product. Where's the best place to kind of find you and, and what you're doing and how people can follow you? I'm all over social at Kara Golden with an I. And uh, yeah, just hopefully inspiring and teaching you about all my mistakes along the way. And, um, and you know, I think that the key thing that I've learned in, in life too is that and I talk about in the book too, is that don't paying attention to somebody in your industry is uh, sometimes it, it's like you, you have the, your own, um, you know, gosh, I should have been doing that or whatever. That's fine. You can learn about that, but you start to learn about other industries and apply that into your industry in your own way. That's how you differentiate yourself. And that's something that I, you know, always share with, friends and you know I'll, I'll go to conferences that just people are scratching their head uh, my assistant will scratch her head what is she doing going to that and I'll just sit down and I'll meet people and you know and I'll just start listening to them and talking to them and and that's what I found like that's where you get the the juice the creative juice to kind of differentiate yourself and when you differentiate yourself and stop comparing yourself especially in your own industry that's when great things happen that's how you're that's how you do things differently and that's how you that's how people that's what people admire too in brands right that the ones that kind of are doing things differently but if instead you're you're copying what other people are doing and trying to uh you know take their road or take their river. It's just, it's not really how the big, the big jumps happen. That's, that's amazing advice. And um, you are inspiring. So, you know, keep doing what you're doing. You're inspiring me and I'm sure you're inspiring millions of others. And uh, I really Thank appreciate, you. I really appreciate you coming on. It was, it was great talking, talking to you. And I'm sure I could talk to you for hours, but I know you're very busy. So I really Thank appreciate you. you coming on. Oh, I appreciate it so much. So have a great rest of the week. Yes, you too. Thank you so much, Kara. Thanks. Absolutely. I hope you enjoyed that amazing podcast and her amazing story with Kara Golden. From the beginnings of moving to New York City to working in Silicon Valley early on to taking her company through the pandemic, she was actually delivering drinks herself. So a real entrepreneur. It was a great story. I learned so much. You may see more of her in the future with us, so stay tuned. Also, next episode, make sure you check us out on our YouTube channel, Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, Anchor Podcasts. We're having a great guest next time, Brandon Adams. He's a video creator. He's got a new television show coming out, and he's a serial entrepreneur. You don't want to miss this. Catch us next time.